Coming up on This Week in Computer Hardware, whoa, Intel just cut a lot of jobs. Lenovo's Yoga 700 says good things can come cheap. About that PlayStation 4 Neo, bargain subwoofers, and Corsair's Rapid Fire. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 360, recorded April 21st, 2016. A bargain laptop and Intel's big cuts. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service and the most sophisticated way to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit Wealthfront.com slash Twitch and sign up to get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash Twitch. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you a lot of conversation about hardware occasionally mobile hardware, certainly gaming hardware, but we never pursue excellence or joy because we're very serious here. Right, Ryan? <laughs> wait, wait. We never pursue excellence? <laughs> joy, I, joy, I understand, right? Like, that makes sense. But excellence? I just want to make sure you were listening. We yeah. pursue uh, excellence at all price levels <laughs> at all times on all platforms, operating systems, now known and in the future, including virtual reality, mm -hmm. but never mm -hmm. at dusk. Oh my no. goodness! It's uh, it's a w unusual week for news. Some good news, some bad news. But let's yeah. start. Uh, let's start with some bargain news. The uh, Lenovo Yoga Seven Hundred review, and with a title like "Good Things Can Come Cheap," I think, I suspect, I believe deep in my heart of hearts that Ken Addison over at PC Per found something delightful in this affordable laptop. Yeah, I mean, so this is not anything um, uh, fundamentally new in terms of form factor specifications, right? It's a Skylake-based two-in-one Ultrabook, whatever you want to call it. It's a yoga device, so it it flips around and bends in half the wrong way, all those things you expect. Um, it is, a, it's a Yoga 700, so the specifications and stuff, like the build quality is a little bit different than the Yoga 900. It's a, uh, a little bit, I think this is a 13.3 inch screen on this one, or is this the 14 and the 900 is the, this is the, this is a 14 inch 1080p screen. It is touch enabled. Uh, it's got a Core i5-6200 in it, 8 gigs of RAM, 256 gigs SATA SSD. The, the real kind of... Um, <clears throat> differentiator here is the design kind of the 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 look and feel of it is very much more like it's very much like the kind of original yoga designs this is kind of where that design lives on as opposed to the much more thin kind of curvy uh uh versions that live on on the yoga 900 and uh those types of things this is fairly straightforward fairly basic it has a price tag of 899 um, mm -hmm. MSRP coming from Lenovo. I think he said he found it for like 840 on Amazon uh, when he was writing this up as well. And if you compare that to like the Dell XPS 13 that has a 13.3 inch 1080p screen, uh, same processor, same memory, similar SSD, um, same capacity, but maybe a little bit slower. It's, you know, you're talking about $250 more expensive uh, mm -hmm. out the gate for that Dell machine uh, versus the Yoga 700. And obviously the Yoga 900 with the Core i7 processor and uh, the high resolution screen is going to be a little bit more even than that. Um, so it's, you know, I think he, he got a little gruff in the comments or uh, during our podcast last night about <clears throat> calling this a cheap machine because it is still 800 to 900 bucks. It's not cheap, but it is inexpensive in comparison to a lot of uh, other two-in-ones of similar specification, sure. I guess, is the way to look at it. Uh, it wasn't a perfect machine. Like, he's not, he's not a fan of the trackpad. And I think uh, Lenovo kind of has two distinct series of trackpads that they use on their different laptops. As far as I can tell, some of, some of them are kind of softer, squishier, and some of them are more rigid and, and clicky. Uh, in terms of what the feel is on pushing down on them. Uh, this was right. more of the kind of softer style trackpad. Ken's not a I soft think, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I don't know if there are some people that actually like those more. Um, mm -hmm. 
than the other ones or if they're just cheaper, right? Whether or not there's right. there's a technical reason or like a user experience reason why you'd have some one or the other or if there's just if it's like a cost structure issue uh, on that. You've got your USB 3. Yeah, yeah, it could be. It, yeah, you're right. It could be both. Performance-wise, it's uh, it performs like an Ultrabook, right? It's a Core i5 dual-core hyper-threaded processor. Um, it's Core i5 6200U, so it's basically identical performance to the... Uh, Skylake um, uh, Dell XPS 13, but you know, depending on if what you were going to get the other way in terms of performance uh, of a higher end processor like the Core i7 um, uh, part of the Yoga 900, you know, you can get a little bit more out of it if you if you needed performance. The um, but but I would say for the vast majority of people, this is going to have enough performance to do the types of things that you would expect to do on an Ultrabook, I guess. Right. Um, the battery life on it was a little bit disappointing uh, on the last page. He uh, uh, has a comparison to the Surface Pro 4, the XPS 13 with Skylake, the Yoga 900 with uh, Skylake. And the Yoga 700 comes in at the bottom. Uh, it had 4.92 hours of battery life compared to the XPS 13 that had 6.7 hours of battery. Life. So that's a fairly significant and noticeable difference, um, even though both of those are using uh, 1080p screens. So it's... Um, worth pointing out then, I guess, that for whatever reason, because even the Lo uh, Lenovo Yoga 900 gets like over seven hours of battery life as well. Mm. So there, there's something there's something else at play here, whether it be the quality of screen or something like right. that, um, because processor-wise, performance-wise, there should be very little very little uh, variance between uh, the, the different parts. But in terms of getting a... a a yoga style kind of convertible two in one laptop that's in this form factor that's that's based on Skylake and, and has you know these specifications. Uh, you're not you don't find a whole lot of options that are going to be less expensive than this. And as long right. as you can, you know, as long as you're willing to say, okay, I don't need more than four to five hours of battery life for what my use case is, uh, the Yoga 700 can be pretty good. But if you need more than that, uh, you probably want to start looking at some of the other options available. It was interesting earlier this year, I looked at, uh, you know, talked about the XPS 13 and I ended up in a conversation in the YouTube comments, which is always a scary place to get in the comments, um, talking about that review. And somebody's like, oh, you didn't get very deep into like the speeds and feeds or the specs or the benchmarks, I paraphrase. And in, uh, part of the reason I didn't is because most Core i5 laptops of the same generation are delivering pretty much the same performance. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you have the same amount of memory, if you're, you know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of, you're not looking at like, oh, the... The Lenovo motherboard design versus the Dell motherboard design is going to be that much faster or slower. Uh, it's so much of what's wrapped around that and the choice for the glass and the screen and the keyboard that are making more of a difference uh, uh, in how it feels. Yep, you're correct. Case, yeah. Good stuff. It's good stuff. Uh, what did you do to MSI's new gaming laptop? <laughs> I didn't do anything except... Uh, <laughs> so they basically... The title, what they did I was hoping you Go took ahead. it apart based on the breaking down MSI's gaming notebooks. Um, no, no. See, I actually, the original title of the story was breaking down MSI's gaming notebook lineup. Um, but then I decided it was a little bit too wordy, so I took the word lineup out of it. The um, Essentially what we did here is MSI sent me six different gaming notebooks based on Skylake, their most, their current shipping ones, those six there that you kind of see in that table as a representation of the 27 available SKUs that they offer across their different lines of gaming notebooks today. Uh, and the impetus for this was uh, somebody asked me, hey, what gaming laptop do you recommend from MSI? And I said, I have no idea, right? Because there's, there's so many of them out there. They vary um, so much inside the series, and then they vary so much outside, like from series to series, both intra-series and intra-series, I guess I should say. Uh, and... Um, so I started to just kind of ask around. I was like, okay, so what are the differences here at MSI? What's the difference between a GE and a GS and a GT72 and a GT80? And they're like, well, you know, this and this and this. It's like, why don't you send me one of each and we'll do a video comparison and kind of try to give people, like, not reviews of these laptops, but, like, information about if you value this, this is the laptop series you should look at, and then a little bit more detail on what each of those specifications are. So that's what this... This story in this video really attempting to do was uh, if it's not to convince people to buy gaming notebooks, it's not to convince people to not, but it's like if you think you want a gaming notebook, but you have no idea 
what, how much you're going to spend or what your options are. Um, this is a pretty good guide for getting started down that path. So um, that means, you know, if you start the GE series, you're ranging from like $1,099 to $1,699, I think, in prices. The GS series uh, is available at 14, 15, and 17-inch screen sizes in 1080p and 4K. Uh, up to $2,149 in terms of price, $2,149. You get the GT72S, which is kind of like the, the, the GT72 series is what I think most people think of when they imagine a gaming notebook in their head. It's almost two inches thick. It's about 8.5, 8.9 pounds heavy. Um, it's a big, bulky machine, but it's going to have a lot of horsepower in there. And in terms of gaming notebooks, it's amongst the best price for your dollar. And then you have the GT80, which is that insane one that they're all SLI configurations and they all have mechanical keyboards. I'm sure you've seen one of those from time to time, Patrick, um, with an 18.4 inch screen on that guy. Uh, and that is 9.9 .9 pounds. So basically 10 pounds uh, for that. Plus, you know, the, the power adapter that you have to uh, continue to bring with you everywhere. Um, the... Like I said, th th these aren't reviews, right? But we did look at a, at a couple of interesting things in performance. For one, the CPU performance on all six of the laptops we tested was essentially identical. They were all quad-core hyper-threaded processors within 100 megahertz of each other. If you look at the 27 available SKUs that MSI has, um, they should all basically have identical performance across the board in terms of CPU scaling, uh, which is interesting to note. But GPU scaling obviously is going to be where everything differs. you got the 960, you got the 970, uh, 960M, 970M, 980M, and then the actual, the full-size desktop 980. Uh, and then obviously the green bar there, the GT80 representing some multi-GPU stuff. So like I said, it's not a, these aren't reviews, these aren't uh, teardowns. This is more of a, hey, if you're interested in what the lineup is for MSI Gaming Notebooks, if, uh, if you kind of want to figure out a way to compare, do I want a GE, a GS, a GT, uh, it's kind of a good starting point, I think, for people to do that. Did any of them stand out as particularly good bargains or favorites? It's hard to say anything like bargain with uh, <laughs> gaming laptops like this, uh, but I will say, actually, surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, none of the six they actually sent me are ones that I would particularly recommend for consumers it would but i but having all six of them and seeing what the performance was and what the form factors were like i, I came to a couple of conclusions um that like if if you just need a, a gaming notebook and you know a gtx 970m is enough performance mm -hmm. for you for a 1080p screen there's a gt 72 dominator that is 1599 right so it's still not cheap by any stretch uh, but in terms of gaming notebooks, it's relatively inexpensive. And it's got a 17-inch screen. It's got 60 gigs of memory. It's got an SSD plus a one terabyte hard drive. Like, it's it's a pretty well-specced out machine. And then if you want that kind of performance, but you want a little bit slimmer design, you can get the GS70 Stealth Pro. That's $16.99, so just 100 bucks more. Uh, you lose the optical drive, uh, but you get the same GTX 970M and CPU perf. Uh, but okay. chances are, because it's thinner, you're going to have fans spinning a little bit faster to get the heat out right so you get maybe you get a little bit more noise mm -hmm. from it as well so that's you know some of the trade-offs you get and then if you go up from there you can you can spend 500 bucks more and i think the the next gt72 up uh moves from the 970m to a 980m and you get a 256 gig ssd instead of a 128 and those are kind of the the primary differences there um but man is it you know i had msi make me a cheat sheet of an Excel doc that had all 27 listed with all the right. processors and the GPUs available, and memory configurations, and it's easy to see how people can get confused even just starting looking at this stuff. Yeah, there's I don't know. Yeah. There's well, no, I mean, I, I, yeah, about Saturday. Well, there's a ridiculous number of models. Um, ridiculous. In looking at many laptop manufacturers in the last few months, there are so many options. And in some oh, yeah. cases where they have, you know, direct ordering systems, some options may not be available on a particular time when you are shopping. Yep. That could be incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. If you're looking for a single selection, one choice, just tell me what to buy kind of recommendation. The Wirecutter is a great place to get it. Um, it's really good people. 
uh, from some magazines and websites you know and love. Uh, basically, do huge roundups for the wire cutter. I wanted to point out their latest one today, uh, the best budget subwoofer. Uh, Brent Butterworth wrote that up for the wire cutter. Um, they picked out after 20 hours of testing, like blind testing. Um, <laughs> you know, I assume the subwoofers were hidden behind a sheet. Uh, uh, but they, uh, they picked the $110 monoprice 9723, hmm. um, you know, yeah, literally, uh, it's like a hundred bucks, you know, 108 bucks plus shipping. Um, and it, look, you can order one, uh, and it'll ship today if you order it in the next 54 minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, they, uh, listen to a ton of stuff, um, you know, Bic America, Pioneers, uh, Andrew Jones designed SW8 MK2. And a whole bunch of others, um, you know, if you're not going to spend three, four hundred dollars and get like an entry level shoe subwoofer, uh, there are some pretty spectacular options here. And if you if you basically want more bass, if you feel like your explosions aren't hitting on a game, uh, if you would like to hear, you know, everything below, you know, 80 or 100 hertz, depending on where your speakers on your desktop, uh, computer desktop cut off uh, a subwoofer like this would make a big difference. Um, yeah. You know, if you do not have, if, if you do, you know, it's kind of funny if you've never heard, um, your speakers, your current speakers, and they have less than four or five inch, uh, you know, if you, if you have five inch, uh, drivers on your speakers or smaller, and you've never heard them with a subwoofer, it's probably worth a hundred bucks to get a subwoofer just so you can hear all of the music you're missing. Uh, mm -hmm. especially if you like piano, bass, concerts, explosions in video games, uh, a subwoofer will make a huge difference. You know, this is not going to fill a 60 foot by 40 foot, you know, entertainment hall, you know, full of people dancing, you know, but if you're in an office, uh, you know, a small office or a bedroom, uh, this will make a huge difference. And the price yeah. is ridiculous for the money. I just want to give a shout out for that. Um, in the not so bargainy end of things, but in the pursuit of excellence also, of course, there's rapid fire. I'm allowed to talk about it as of like 6 a.m. this morning. Um, that's the upside down version of the Corsair <laughs> rapid fire. Um, <laughs> let me do the right side up version of the Corsair. Um, there you go. There we go. Look at those glorious RGB keys, kids. Um, these are the new Rapid Fire Cherry MX Speed, which are currently exclusive to the folks at Corsair. Uh, they feature 1.2 millimeters of travel uh, versus a, like a 1.5 to 2 millimeters, which is typical of most mechanical switches, which means you will get all of the activity faster as you press the key down. That's what they're saying. I am not badass enough of a Counter-Strike player to be able to tell you that this keyboard made a huge difference in my Counter-Strike performance because I get my ass kicked by serious Counter-Strike players, no matter what keyboard or mouse I'm using. But if you True. are a serious Counter-Strike player and or other, uh, uh, you know, first-person shooter Twitch games where you're looking for all of the keyboard speed and performance, um, you know, like most of them, a 45-gram actuation force, it's a great keyboard to type on. Um, basically, the key, um, you know, the, you know, if you get it a little over a millimeter down, you're going to shoot the gun, you're going to make the turn, you're going to switch between things. Um, you know, the uh, per key colored LED backlighting, which has been around on the K70s for a while, uh, the K70 RGB, it is a healthy $170. Um, mm. But if you are trying to kill all of the things in your Counter Strike addiction, uh, this might be the path to. Uh, to killing all of the things in Counter-Strike. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to trying it. Of course, here sent us one, but it went to the wrong person. It went to the wrong reviewer, so it's in Texas. Oh, no. So now in it's going to be... It's in Texas. For, now it's going to be Texas. something. Maury. Maury lives in uh, Dallas. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and I think this is the... So, like, I actually got, at the same time, I got the, you know, the press release from Corsair about this keyboard and the press release from Cherry about this key switch. So, um... It is a is a new switch from Cherry um, that Corsair yeah. probably has some timed exclusivity on of some kind. Uh, I don't know when that will expire, when other right. people may be able to use it, but uh, it, it sounds impressive. I'd like to try it. So you, you liked it not just, you liked, liked it for it. actually like typing as well, right? Not yes. just for yeah, potentially I probably, improved gaming. Yeah, they've got some like, you know, WASD you know, replacement keys that kind of are textured and, and have some slope yep. to them so you can get your super gaming on. I don't know if I'd leave those on for everyday office use, uh, but if sure. I was using this exclusively for gaming, I probably would. 
you know, I like Cherry MX keys. I, I, my favorite is still IBM Model M and the Buckling Spring keyboards because I love them and it's the best keyboard design ever made, period. Uh, but I'm a freak of nature uh, who's been using those keyboards forever. Uh, I was vindicated, however, by watching some badass Counter-Strike players uh, grab that. Uh, keyboard that IBM keyboard try to steal it from me back in the day. So nice. Uh, yeah, of course. You know, look, it, it's you know, if you want to program, there's they they have when these first came out, these RGB keys. Um, you know, they were kind of a nightmare to program. I say that uh, with love and affection, but it was a lot of work. Yeah, that's there's true. now a ton of pre-programmed. You basically you can download all these different pre-programmed settings. Um, I do really like the ridiculous over the knob. I'm gonna border on saying uh, tactical volume knob with these sort of. See if I can get it actually in the camera, but you know, I mean, the ridiculous like I own I own wrenches that don't have knurling that's cut as deep uh, as it is on the volume knob on this. You know. It's luxury. It's high when end. Your hands get sweaty, man. You know, you got to have that grip. <laughs> or, yeah. Or you just poke the volume control. It's well constructed. <laughs> um, you know, they've decided to make the back of the keys white instead of black. That reflects more of the RGB uh, lights. So you get idea. more of the, yeah. I mean, because what you're, you know, a lot of what you're paying for here, yes, you're getting 1.2 millimeters of travel on the keys, but a lot of what you're paying for is this ridiculously over the top, awesome collection of, you know, you know what 16.4 million colors per key um if you if you want to have all of the shiny keys and be able to program each one individually i want but you to try to count bling. all those colors <laughs> one two three set each one individual <laughs> <laughs> no no unless you plan on raising my children for me or letting me live on your couch after my wife divorces my ass all right um, Goodness. No, not into that. <laughs> yeah. Let us take a moment to thank our sponsor. Oh, my goodness. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Wealthfront. You invest for the long term for you or your family's financial health. Perhaps you want to retire someday because uh, you don't want to work until you die and get put in a box. Um, you know, trying to do it yourself, especially the right way, is complex. It's time consuming. It can be a little bit frightening. Um, check out Wealthfront. Traditional advisors, they charge pretty big fees between 1% and 3% of what they manage. You might be like, 1%, that's nothing. Well, that's probably 1% per year. That means 10% uh, every 10 years. It starts to add up. With Wealthfront, you play one quarter, 1% a year. That's 25 basis points if you speak in basis points. Zero commissions, no hidden fees. Look, you got uh, $30,000. That's less than $5 a month to manage it. No additional charges for any of Wealthfront services. You can get started investing today with Wealthfront for as little as $500. They're not going to bog you down with a dozen of questions. They've, they basically they simplified their risk identification process that allows you to begin investing sooner. Risk identification is basically figuring out how okay you are with, with investments that might disappear if things go wrong, that might go down. Um, you know, if you're a biscuit away from retiring, you probably don't want to run a lot of risk. If you are young and have a lot of time, a little more risk is a little good, you know, is, is fine. It's okay. It's normal. Um, so they've made it simpler. That means it just takes a couple minutes to sign up at wealthfront.com and it goes right to work monitoring your portfolios around the clock, taking action as soon as an opportunity arises. Um, their portfolios are based on modern portfolio theory. Uh, and they're designed to adjust according to your personal risk tolerance while staying diversified and tax efficient because there's nothing worse than making money but spending it all on taxes, um, at least when you're talking about investing. Wealthfront, they want to be transparent. They want to be accessible. You can view and track all your accounts in one place. And now Wealthfront can track both your Wealthfront and non-Wealthfront bank accounts and brokerage accounts. Uh, and they'll provide that all in a summary of your assets. You can see every trade that Wealthfront makes on your behalf in your dashboard, on your desktop, or with the mobile app. Wealthfront now manages almost $3 billion in client assets, and it is growing rapidly every day. Look, it is time. If you haven't started saving yet, especially if you're in your 20s, start saving now. Uh, uh, you know, start, start, you know, they don't even think of it as saving. Start building your wealth. Start uh you know, investing in your future today and do it with Wealthfront and do us a favor, visit wealthfront.com slash TWICH. That's wealthfront.com slash Twitch to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. You'll see the customized allocation they recommend for your profile. And because you're a Twit listener, if you sign up to invest, Wealthfront will manage your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. That's free money, people. 
or, you know, charge free money management. <laughs> Join the many TWIP fans who have seen huge success with Wealthfront and claim your offer today at wealthfront.com slash Twitch. The idea here is if you've tried to invest and you're just like, ah, I don't want to deal with the person at the bank. Oh my goodness, this guy sounds like a shark or a hustler. Wealthfront, it's really simple. It's automated and they want to make it painless. Wealthfront.com slash Twitch to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. We want to thank them for their support of this week in computer hardware. So... The younger you start saving, the sooner you can retire, people, or the sooner you can buy a house or whatever it is you're saving towards. Oh, my goodness. Sony plans PlayStation Neo with massive APU hardware upgrade. I have been listening to friends of mine go berserk over this. Um, Interesting. How come? Well, uh, the idea of having a console with a hardware upgrade mid-console life which is yeah. going to create, uh, you know, if you're a developer, do you design for the first console or the second console or all the consoles? If you're trying to design for all the consoles, are you creating difficulties with, you know, support? Are you increasing the amount of time it's going to take, um, you know, uh, to develop that game and ship that game? Um, you know, Giant Bomb uh, has an interesting report out on it. Uh, and they're basically, they're saying uh, more processing power, uh, you know, 4K focused. The code name is Neo. Um, you know, uh, we've heard uh, rumbles on this on on both the Microsoft Xbox and the Sony PlayStation side, but uh, the, the the details are leaking on the Sony side uh, first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, one of the things uh, well, you actually point out is is Giant Bomb doesn't Giant Bomb isn't one of those websites that dandles made up stuff. To generate page views, um, you know, they if they're reporting it means they they have pretty solid confirmation. Um, higher clock speed than the original PlayStation Four, improved GPU, higher bandwidth on the memory, um, same hard disk drive as the PlayStation Four, uh, but they're not certain if that means in terms of capacity or connection speed. Quote, games running in Neo mode will be able to use the hardware upgrades and an additional 512 uh, megabytes in the memory budget to offer increased and more stable frame rights and higher visual fidelity, at least when those games run at 1080p on HDTVs. The Neo will also support 4K image output, but games themselves are not required to be 4K native, end quote. Which is good because most 4K televisions do a decent job of scaling 1080p to 4K, um, mm -hmm. you know, so and, and will look just fine. Um, but, you know, uh, basically like from 1.8, uh, 1.6 gigahertz uh, uh, or eight Jaguar cores running at 1.6 gigahertz up to 2.1. Uh, that's pretty much a 25% increase. Um, yep. Doubling the number of, of uh, CUs uh, in the GPU uh, and giving it a very modest uh, uh, bump in performance. Um, more stream processors. You know, yeah, so like the, the, the clock processors, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you're more than doubling stream processor count, uh, and you are increasing the clock speed by fifteen percent or so. Um, that's a that's that's a healthy jump. That's you're gonna have more than two x performance boost on the GPU side itself. Now, the only thing that may hold it back from that equivalence is the fact that the memory bandwidth is going from 176 to 218 gigabytes per second. So that's there's a boost there. Uh, it's still using 8 gigs of GDDR5. It's just running at a higher clock speed. Um, that memory bandwidth will likely hold back the, the, the total scaling capability or scaling performance capability of the jump from PS4 to Neo. Um, I mean, you're almost looking at, if you just look at shader counts and clock speeds, you're almost looking at the performance of an R9 390, a little bit less than that. Um, mm -hmm. but, the, but the big discussion is uh, around this is what architecture is the GPU. There's a very good chance that this is going to be based on AMD's upcoming Polaris architecture, the one that we expect to see in June for the PC. Uh, and if that's the case, that will help. That'll help Sony, and if Microsoft does the same thing, that'll help them uh, with with uh, scaling of power consumption, right? Because Polaris mm -hmm. is a much more efficient architecture, and it also means that they'll be able to use that 14 nanometer FinFET process technology. Again, helping with with power consumption, helping you get to the higher clock speeds, being able to build this into a uh, reliable form factor um, that will fit inside of a of a console, and maybe make it cheaper because again, the rumored price of this system is going to be three ninety nine. 
that may be this holiday season. That may be next spring um, for when it's actually released. I'm very curious about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I, I'm impressed that they, if they do this and, and if the documents that Giant Bomb has where they talked about right. starting October 1st, um, all games will have to have both a base PS4 path and a uh, Neo path, right? Mm -hmm. And they can graphically differ but feature wise they will be forced to be identical so you won't be able to have you know 32 player multiplayer matches matches with neo but only 16 on ps4 right or or, or something like that so it, it's interesting to me because it, it does create a totally new shift in the console market where you'll have not just it's not it's we're not going from ps3 to ps4 it's literally Consoles four to four point five. yeah i mean it's it, like it is a lot 10. of that yeah, it is. It is a lot like that. So I'm very curious how they handle that, um, how they enforce it on the software side. They 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 have to enforce it to make this right. a I, I don't know to make it like a, you're either if you 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 risk totally pissing off the people who bought a PS4 previously if somehow their games stop working or they can't play the latest games or they can't play the latest games with people who bought Neo. Um, yeah. And you've also got to address this pretty quickly because now that this information is out here, you, nobody would buy a PS4. Like you'd be insane at this point to buy a PS4 without knowing what uh, the changes are going to come. It's possible that maybe at E3, Sony announces this kind of program officially and maybe they announce a price cut for the PS4 in preparation for that, uh, still allowing them to build up the user base for PS4 um, while creating a little bit of price room in their in their lineup for uh, the Neo to launch at, um, but we'll have to see. But not very long. That's that's the beginning part of June, I think, or mid mid June for E3. So sooner than we thought. Oh my goodness, I am really curious to see how that goes down. Nvidia GTX 1080 GPU cooler pictured. Maybe less exciting news here. But look well, at it. Look you know, at that cooler. That's a that 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 is like the razor mice mouse engineering design of cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's it's yeah. it looks kind of like a spaceship. It looks like you could beat somebody to death with it. It could be a uh, got a lot of sharp edges. Yeah, you know, an offensive weapon used by you know somebody angry in a Star Trek movie. Um, it's interesting because the. the the design is the same as the mm -hmm. other reference cooler, like the 9 series and the 7 series cooler in terms of the coloration and the, with the fan location and there's a window. Uh, but they just went from like a few angles to a lot of angles, very polygonal-like. But I, I, I like it, but everybody's going to have their own opinion. What do you think about the name GTX 1080? It's pretty much assured that that's what it is now that we've seen so many different leaks of this cooler. I'm curious to find out what I don't know. I'm curious what the new parts are going to be. I'm curious what the new speed is going to be. I'm curious what the performance is going to be compared to the 980. Um, you know, uh, you know, show me a shipping part that you've yeah. benchmarked, and I'll get a lot more excited about it. It's going to be the, the fastest goal. GPU ever. And well, I, you know, it's 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 getting you know as as more people pick up uh, you know VR units uh, or 4K. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, VR is more compelling a reason, I think, to upgrade a GPU right now than 4K because there seems to be more VR. Mm -hmm. more, the VR applications are stressing your GPU more than 4K gaming is, dot, 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 because most uh, just aren't a lot of 4K games right now. But um, I'm curious. I'm excited. I can't wait to see it. I'm not nearly as excited as, as I was when I caught your article this morning on uh, console gaming uh, on the PC, PS4 remote play versus Xbox One streaming. Um, yep. I'm not familiar with Jim. Seems to be no. He's he's roster. a he's a he's a guest uh, columnist. He wrote a, a Plex okay. guide for us a couple of years ago as well. Nice. Yeah. Well, then I I feel better about not recognizing his name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. he went deep on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, at least it felt. Like, I mean, you know, the Xbox One, PlayStation Four limitations. Um, it's interesting to look at the feature uh, compatibility, right? So play, PlayStation 4 uh, remote play is Windows 8.1, Windows 10, OS 10 Yosemite, OS 10 uh, El Capitan. Xbox One streaming works with Windows 10. Uh, PlayStation 4 remote play is wired on the controllers. Xbox One can do wire to wireless. Um, 
PlayStation 4 remote play can be 720p, 540p, or 360p, running at either 60 frames per second or 30 frames per second. Um, Xbox One has very high, which is 1080p, 60 frames per second, or high, medium, and low. Both of them do lossy stereo. Um, PlayStation 4 uh, does remote access. Xbox One streaming doesn't. Um, Xbox One will do keyboard text entry. PlayStation 4 remote play does not. Um, you know, the... Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to quote Jim, um, you know, when comparing Xbox one streaming to PlayStation four remote play, there's also no clear overall winner at this stage. Xbox one streaming is the hands down video quality champion, but you're limited to using windows 10 inside your home network. On the other hand, PlayStation four remote play solves the platform and location limitations, but offers questionable video quality and a lack of deep integration with your PlayStation account and friends. So if, if you're in a windows 10 house, uh, you know, uh, Xbox One seems to have the lead there in terms of video performance. Um, if not, PlayStation 4 is more attractive. That said, you're probably going to use whichever one is available for your preferred console if you only have one. Uh, and also, yeah. both of them seem to be... Uh, we have hopes that both of them will evolve uh, over time as quickly as possible. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's... I think it's pretty impressive. I mean, he does comment that uh, in terms of pure image quality, the the Xbox One uh, has is the only one that supports 1080p 60, uh -huh. uh, and it's definitely the most visually impressive. Um, PS4 actually, <coughs> excuse me, peaks at 720p 60, I guess. Mm -hmm. So you get a little bit. Uh, he's, he says it's noticeably softer when compared directly to the Xbox, kind of a uh, side by side. Um, and he actually, if you go to the third page of the story he did, there's a video where you can watch uh, where he was capturing some of the output from it uh, as well. And you, you'll have to blow it up and, and run it at 1080p60 to really start to see some of the differences. But he used NHL 16. It's actually a pretty good game for that. There's a lot of white colors, so you can easily see uh, any kind of aliasing or fuzziness that occurs on the text and the characters' names and that type of stuff. Um, but uh, pretty good. But it's not none of this is perfect, right? Like he he commented several times throughout that um, you know there's still a latency, right? It, there's still mm -hmm. latency even when you're you're playing on your local network, right? It's still there, right? Uh, and you will get hiccups every once in a while, either in image quality or kind of like a stutter here and there. Uh, you know, you might if you're used to watching streaming video, which I assume many of our viewers and readers and listeners are. <laughs> Um, it's a safe assumption. <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll see instances where like maybe the quality dips for a few seconds before it comes back up, right? Like those are the types of things that will happen with this because you're essentially dealing with streaming video uh, inside your home. Um, but I just I, I agree with you. I, I love the idea that they're that they're doing more of this stuff that that it's not just Microsoft trying to promote Windows 10. It's like Sony says, well, we can do this too. It's not that hard to do, integrate their own system, and it's actually way more uh, open in terms of, hey, you can run this on your Macs, you can run this on Windows 10, 8, uh, and beyond, right? So it's, it's, it's neat to see them uh, take that, that on there as well. But still, still some work to do. They can always make this better um, from both parties, but... If you've got an Xbox upstairs and you want to play downstairs and you've got a PC, now you have options and you have a comparisons and stuff about how the setup works and everything. So uh, Jim did a good job on that story. Thank you, Jim. NZXT announces partnership with Human IT for Earth Day Recycling Program. Um, I have a, I have always had, I've, well, I've had mixed uh, feelings about Earth Day since the very first one. Uh, one, because every day should be Earth Day and you should always be looking for chances to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, number two, uh, the very first Earth Day had a big Earth Day concert uh, that I remember, or the big, the first Earth Day I remember had a very big Earth Day concert, and people left giant mounds of trash in Central Park uh, in New York, which were epic. That said, uh, it is nice that NZXT is partnering with Human IT to help users recycle their unwanted technology, writes Sebastian Peake. With the working items being donated to those in need, as a thank you, NZXT is providing discounts for purchases made on their website for those who participate. So basically, you got a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone, uh, any other electronics that are not functioning. Um, they will turn it over to human IT who will turn them into powerful and free educational tools. Uh, the idea is reducing e-waste and closing the digital divide. Um, you contact, basically give them the device specs and photos. If your device is approved, uh, they will give you a free shipping label uh, to mail the approved devices to human IT. 
And uh, once they receive that, you will get an NZXT discount code uh, for 10 or 15% off various and sundry NZXT items. So it's nice. It's nice for NZXT to do that. Yeah. You know, and uh, they have some pretty cool cases, the Manta ITX cases. Um, I particularly like the one that's pictured on the web page there, uh, which I think is the H440. It's a good-looking case. It makes some nice stuff, power supplies, cooling, and various and sundry accessories. Yeah. 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 What's going on with the uh, the Zotec, the PCIe uh, one version of the GTX 710? This is this is like sort of a, if you have a home theater PC and you need a GPU and you don't want to spend any money. Uh, this is so. This is an interesting product, right? Because the GTX 710 is going to be slower than most integrated graphics on modern processors. Yes. Right. Uh, and so that's important to keep in mind. This is not a, oh, it's a drop-in upgrade if you have Intel integrated graphics. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it is really meant as a display output, right? So if you are, uh, you know, you're on a, a motherboard or a platform that only has one or two display outputs and you want some more for whatever productivity tasks you're doing or, or home theater tasks you have, uh, this basically allows you to get additional outputs. You get a VGA, an HDMI, and a DVI connection on there um it's only a 25 watt card which is probably my guess on the high side of estimation for that actual gpu um it's it's completely passively cooled it's a single slot and it installs into a pcie by one connector right which gives you an indication of the performance level of the part right so uh it's got one gig of ddr3 memory now, actually this is a gt 710 i should i should i'll clarify that i'll fix that story it's not a gtx 710 they they dropped the x these aren't extreme enough to get an x as you can see there um but <laughs> if you have a system and you run a display outputs for whatever reason uh either you don't have a discrete card or you've filled up the ones on your discrete card uh, and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money for upgrade. These are the types of cars that this is for, right? This is not. Uh, this is not even a hey, put this in your card so you can play World of Warcraft better, or put this in your system so you can play WoW better, right? Your chances are, if you have a Haswell or later processor, your system will already play those games uh, a little bit better, better than this. Um, but Just you need saying. to have those options, especially if you only have a single buy one PCIe connection. Right as well, and there's a lot of you know, super small motherboards and platforms that are built like that. And I have several of them scattered around the office I'm in right now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, you're ready. I was a little surprised that Leanne Lee was announcing a standing computer desk enclosure uh, back at CES. Uh, the DK04. A um, couple of nice features about that. It is uh, powered uh, height adjustments. Um, you know the uh, I like the fact that it's got like the big glass top with lots and lots of fans inside of it. So you can literally build your enclosure. It is your enclosure. It's an enclosure. It's a desk. Um, it is $1,500, which is not particularly expensive for a standing desk, uh, but it is particularly expensive if you're thinking of it as less as a standing desk, uh, more of a PC case. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I find it, uh, I find it pretty amusing. It is, uh, if you've never worked at a standing desk, it is not a bad idea for you to try one. Uh, the idea is that you're going to, uh, oh boy, you know, go to Life Hacker and search standing desk. <laughs> you know, it's gone back and forth a couple of times since it started, uh, whether a uh, standing desk would be more or less beneficial uh, for you. But certainly getting up and moving around from your computer keyboard several times a day will help you mm -hmm. live long. I like the fact that they do have... Uh, you know, pre-programmed settings inside of this. Uh, so you can be like, okay, this is my seated position. This is my standing position. And you can yeah, all make a big difference uh, in an attempt to avoid uh, various and Sunday repetitive stress injury type um, <coughs> injuries, <laughs> RSI injuries. Yeah. Uh, and to keep yourself moving around. It's pretty, you know, when you look at the case under there, uh, it's pretty cool to see that. Although I find it frustrating like any time I've ever seen a, a, a case uh, in a desktop because if you're using the desktop, you can't see all the, the shiny stuff. And if you have a monitor on that desktop, which you probably will, um, unless you're using this to like game with a HD TV or projector across the room, uh, then your keyboard, your mouse, and the monitor will almost entirely cover that beautiful box. That's true. Especially if you have like a big mouse mat or something like that. 
to cover it all. Yeah, yeah, you lose some of that. <laughs> this this is maybe like if you if you wall mount your monitor, there's another use case uh, for something like that. Or I don't know. Maybe you just want to move the keyboard out of the way and stare at it every once in a while. You can do that too, I guess. <laughs> but it does seem like a fairly expensive uh, adventure down that path. Yeah. But well, I don't know. I've, I've cool. seen six thousand dollars standing desks. So true. It is for 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 entry level standing desks. It's certainly at the upper end of the price range. Uh, it is yeah. not. I not even that for powered desks that don't. Assuming it doesn't fall apart in the first six months, uh, it's probably actually not that poorly priced. Because you're talking about okay. big honking actuators uh, being tucked inside of that thing, helping it do its work. Oh, my goodness. Anything you can uh, talk about? Tease that's coming up on... Uh, coming up on... Um, uh, there was one other story I wanted to quickly mention. Oh. Uh, I think we maybe went we went past it in the show notes. Uh, Intel, it was about Intel's restructuring and job cuts. Oh, I may have done that subliminally because of the sadness. Yeah, uh, that's fine. I, I can understand that. I uh, just wanted to <laughs> kind of bring this up. They, they announced this week they're going to restructure. They're going to cut 12,000 jobs, which is about 11% of their workforce, yeah. which is a huge cut for a company this size. Well, it also makes um, you realize, well, it's, 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 I, I, you know, it is a huge cut for a company this size. It is a huge cut, period. Uh, it also yes. makes you realize, a lot of people don't realize just exactly how huge Intel is. Right. Um, that they, you know, uh, they can cut 12,000 people and that's still, you know, 10, 11% of their, um, you know, employees. That's a, yeah, that's a huge number of employees. At yeah, if you think about it, that means they have essentially 120,000 employees or so in the organization. Um, the, the restructuring part of it is more of, uh, it looks like they're going to, like for, for a couple of quarters now, they've focused on IoT, a couple, mm -hmm. maybe four or six quarters, they've focused on Internet of Things and cloud infrastructures. Uh, and they saw huge growth in those areas, profitability in those areas, and so they're kind of redirecting things that way. Um, right. So... The 12,000 people that are going to be fired don't know yet because, you know, they have now they have, now that they've made the decision to do it. They have to go down through the through the system and figure out who those people are, which is, I'm sure, is a nightmare as both a manager and as an employee waiting for that kind of stuff to happen. Um, but it's. The, the the brief little editorial I wrote, which is not very long, kind of goes into the uh, the mindset of what you may think or worry about as an enthusiast, somebody who watches our show, builds PCs, is interested in this type of stuff. Um, We're going to stop making awesome processors. Yes, that is the risk, right? <laughs> Um, but I also point out that Intel's even in recent history has done this a couple of times where they have this yeah. cyclical back and forth love hate relationship with like actual PC performance components. Right. You remember the netbook craze that happened uh, in what, 2002 or something like that, 2004, where Intel was going to focus on the super low power, super cheap, inexpensive designs. As it turns out, people wanted more performance than that, so they kind of came back to it. And then they 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 refocused on, hey, we're going to build mobile phone chips, smartphone chips, and uh, it was too little, too late on that, you know. And and that kind of took their their drive and direction. Uh, but then, you know, fairly recently, as recently as I guess 18 months ago, when they released parts like. Um, uh, uh, Devil's Canyon, right, which was a specific processor built and skewed out for enthusiasts, for gamers, for overclockers. Um, they had done several things along that, along those uh, areas to rededicate themselves to, hey, it turns out this is, it's not a growing business, but it's a very profitable business. Um, and the it's possible that we're just in one of those cycles again. We wait six more months. Intel's going to come back around and be like, yeah, it turns out we love you guys, PC gamers. Here's another part. Um, but one of these times it may stick. Uh, it may actually, Intel may give up on us for whatever that means, right? They're, they're not going to stop making processors for notebooks or for uh, PCs, but they could just de-emphasize it more than they have uh, in current or I'd say in recent generations, um, which is something to worry about, right? And it's something that everybody in the ecosystem has to worry about. When, it, when Intel worries about it, Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, NVIDIA, AMD, everybody else has to worry about it, us, right? Like we have to worry about like, well, if nobody's building computers anymore, I guess there's no need for a PC per or a this week in computer hardware, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's something to to keep an eye on. 
uh, and keep uh, discussing, I guess. But I, th I think we'll know more in the coming months as we find which divisions inside Intel are getting hit the most in terms of the cuts, right. whether or not they're going to drop a bunch of engineers, whether or not they're going to drop a bunch of marketing, a bunch of administration, like that will give us a better indication of kind of what their direction is internally and what they think their direction is going to be for the next, you know, several years. But it is a downer news item and, and it sucks to end on that. But hey, you know, it happened. I didn't do it. I didn't make the decision. <laughs> no. All right. Our thoughts and, uh, and hopes go out for everybody at Intel who gets laid off. And we hope uh, the process of translating, migrating, uh, elevating to your next job is as painless and trauma-free as possible. It sucks when people get laid off, especially when yeah. many people get laid off. Oh, my goodness. Well, on that bright and cheerful note, uh, more hardware reviews on, uh, <laughs> on PCPer.com. <laughs> We got all sorts of computer stuff on techthing.com, including a look at uh, WeBoost Echo, which is their new cell phone booster. If you live in a place where the cell phone service sucks, and uh, as always, do us a favor, tweet at Ryan Schroeder, at Patrick Norton with your questions, and uh, we will see you next week. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schroeder. We'll see you next week on Twitch.